Hello, Dr. Lee. Welcome to this episode of Today on Wall Street. We are so great to have you here today with us. Dr. Lee, you are currently a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, and from 2016 to 2018, you were the senior national security advisor to Australian Foreign Minister Julie Bishop. In that role, you served as the principal advisor on Asia and for economic, strategic, and political affairs in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, I wonder if you can first introduce yourself to our audience a little more. How did your career path intersect with Australia's China policy? Well, first, thank you for having me, Lizzie. I'm really happy to be on here. Um, I, I started researching China probably around um, the first decade of this century, so around 2005, 2006. If you remember then, there were very high hopes that China would be what many refer to as a responsible stakeholder in the regional and a global order. And it seemed to me that some of the, object, the objectives that Beijing had even then were uh, fundamentally incompatible uh, with the notion of it becoming a um, regional and global responsible stakeholder. Um, this got me interested in the question of Australia's relationship with China. And if you remember then, a lot of the focus was on a war and terror, but I felt that China was going to be the big issue uh, for us uh, for the next few decades ahead. Um, as you mentioned, I spent two years in government as the Senior National Security Advisor to the Australian Foreign Minister from 2016. That was an important time uh, for Australia because we were reassessing a lot of our policies and attitudes and approaches to China. And I would have to say that China really dominated uh, most of my work during that two and a bit years in, in the Australian government. Thank you so much for that introduction. And, you know, for those of us who are currently in the United States, it was amazing to see for the past few years how Australia has positioned itself at the sort of the global frontier of confronting China. We know Australia was the first to ban Huawei 5G. It was the first to implement foreign interference laws. And it was the first to call for a transparent inquiry into the uh, source of COVID. So looking back, what were some of the crucial events that led to Australia's changing attitude toward China? And how did Australian decision makers decide it was in the country's best interest to take such a confrontational or proactive approach to confront China? Um, prior to 2016, I would say that Australia was pursuing what you might call a small target approach to China, that is to make ourselves as small a target against any kind of Chinese threats or actions as possible. But I think even then it became apparent that China's attitudes and policies were becoming more assertive and more threatening regardless of whether Australia or any other country for that matter pursued softer or harder policies against China. Uh, so in other words, uh, I think the assessment was that China was heading in the direction that it wanted to head regardless of how we were responding or reacting to China. Um, if, if you look at the Australian uh, policies or the policies that Australia took, which really annoyed China, and you mentioned two of them, the banning of Huawei from our 5G and the, uh, um, um, the legislation to target foreign interference and covert influence, if you think about those two issues, those are two things that we felt was important to safeguard our own domestic institutions, our own domestic infrastructure. So as far as we, we were concerned, we saw them as domestic policies. And we, we believe that it was China that was actually interfering in um, our right to make domestic policy. So I remember being in government from 2016 to 18, and even in the early years of 2016, uh, behind closed doors, uh, at senior levels, we were constantly threatened by the Chinese in case we dared take uh, policies that were essentially domestic in nature. So that was really the Australian mindset, which was um, it's unfortunate that China doesn't like the direction that we're going, but we need to take these uh, policies to safeguard, safeguard ourselves. I don't think Australia started out to be some kind of leader of any anti-China grouping, but I think that's just the way it's turned out because we made a lot of decisions before other countries. Other countries, particularly five vice countries, naturally consulted us 
um, and asked us about our experiences and reasoning when we took those decisions. So I think that even though Australia appears like it's now become a, a global or at least a five eyes leader of against of, of a pushback against China, that wasn't the intention. It was really just to safeguard ourselves, and that's just the way it it, it has happened. I see. I see. And as you know, like, like many other um, like-minded countries or liberal democracies in the in the world, Australia is currently challenged by this dilemma or this need to balance its economic dependence on China and its own values. And as you know, China has been Australia's largest trading partner and now accounts for roughly more than a third of its exports. And in the past few weeks or months, we've seen China weaponizing its dependence um, by imposing tariffs and calls all kinds of troubles for Australia. So based on initial data, do we have any assessment of how effective those punitive measures taken by Beijing has been and how much or little has the Australian economy been affected by Beijing's punishment? Uh, at, at a macro level, um, the effects have not been overly devastating. And in fact, the export receipts from China over the past 12 months has gone up but it's largely gone up because of record iron ore prices, which makes up um, you know, probably around half of our exports now to, to China. Now, in certain sectors, and mainly wine, timber and lobsters, the, the effects have been devastating. But because Australia is generally a um, producer of high quality commodities, it's easy for us to find alternative markets in most instances. Um, if, if, if the Chinese have, have done what they've done. So, for example, when the Chinese banned a lot of our, or some of our coal, we found alternative markets. Uh, when they banned um, some of our um, barley, we found alternative markets. In commod I think in a commodities trade, it's easy to find export markets than in specialised niche trades. Um, bear in mind, though, that if you think about what the Chinese are doing and why they're doing what they're doing to Australia, China doesn't unilaterally have the capability to cripple the Australian economy, but the economic sanctions or punishments are not about crippling the Australian economy. It's more a psychological tool and a political tool. It's about trying to persuade or compel our leaders to change their policy, to change our policies uh, at, with respect to China. So um, from that point of view, it hasn't worked because what it's done is, um, to put it very in very simplistic terms, it's created so much anger and resentment amongst uh, stakeholders and even citizens in Australia that the psychological willingness to tolerate uh, economic disruption has actually increased. So China is now further away from um, achieving its goals uh, than, than it was when it started these measures. Now, having said that, it's still a very uncomfortable position for us to be in. But what it's done is it's sped up this whole conversation about diversification. And that, that conversation about diversifying away from China was always there, but a combination of the Chinese um, economic punishments and COVID-19 has really fast-tracked that conversation. Uh, and and, and that's, that's what Australia is doing now, trying to seek out alternative markets. So India, Europe, United Kingdom, uh, Southeast Asia, they're the strongest possibilities. I see, I see. So as you know, in addition to the economic threats and the coercions we just discussed, sometimes Beijing also resort to other more malicious uh, activities like blatant hostage diplomacy. And in the past few years, we've seen a growing number of high profile Australian citizens being detained in China. And the two most notable recent cases seem to be Dr. Yang Hengjun and Chen Lei, uh, the host of CGTN, who happens to be an Australian citizen. So I wonder whether you have any updates on those cases. What's the current status of those cases and how do you expect those cases to proceed in the future? Um, just, just on those cases and, and bringing up Dr. Yang and Cheng Lei is actually quite significant because these cases demonstrate the Chinese Communist Party's attitude to race or ethnicity. Uh, namely that anyone of Chinese ethnicity um, in their view, ought to show perpetual loyalty to the Communist Party. And in both cases, the individuals had criticised aspects of the Chinese leadership and Chinese policy. So, for example, Yang had criticised the growing, what he called the show, the mystic nationalism in China under Xi Jinping. 
uh, Chang had allegedly mocked the record of authorities in managing the COVID-19 virus within China. Um, so, so these two individuals, unfortunately, were perceived to have uh, betrayed their, their mother, motherland and, and they are in a pre predicament that they are. Now, in terms of the prospects for them, um, I wouldn't say that they were targeted necessarily because they had a connection to Australia, but I would say that because of the poor bilateral relationship now between Australia and China, um, Beijing is unlikely to entertain any request for leniency from Canberra. And in fact, um, the, as, as many of you viewers would know, um, senior um, members of the government in Beijing are even refusing to answer phone calls from our ministers. So we don't even really have a capacity to plead for leniency. Um, our Australian ambassador in Beijing has also complained that he has been given um, inadequate access to particularly Dr. Yang over the past year or so, uh, which is against the agreement that we have with China. Uh, so I'm afraid that the prospects for these two individuals, particularly Dr. Yang, um, seem quite uh, poor. I see. I see. Thank you for that introduction. And speaking of this messy relationship with China, Australia is far from the single country. Uh, you know, Australia has become sort of a test case for how to resist to Beijing's um, coercions and threats. I wonder, based on the Australian experience, what lessons can we draw from from the Australian experience, and how? What advice would you would you give to other mid sized countries facing the same kind of dilemma? and whether the international community, especially the United States, can do a better job in coordinating its response to Beijing? Oh, they're, they're all really good questions. I, I'll, I'll begin with what's probably a uh, false quote by Lenin, but it's been attributed to Lenin, um, which he apparently said, you should probe with bayonets. If you feel mush, proceed. If you encounter steel, withdraw. Now, on strategic issues and also on economic issues in terms of the predatory economic issues that, we, that, that China has been engaged in, uh, I, my view is that China has got as far as it has because there has been fairly minimal resistance. And on economic coercion issues, as I mentioned, it is more a psychological tool rather than uh, a material one. It, it is about lowering the political will to resist uh, rather than necessarily economically destroying a country which China cannot do. Um, countries have to be uh, very clear and firm about specific policies that are um, related to their national interests. Um, they have to set their anchor point with China as much as possible and, and be prepared to bear some immediate disruption when they do so. The way I'll describe what's happening between Australia and China now um, Australia is not necessarily trying to completely decouple from China. In fact, that's impossible. We're trying to renegotiate the terms of our economic, our strategic, our political, our diplomatic relationship. And of course, that's difficult. But I think if you don't do that, then China sets the standards for, for your country, not, not your own country. So my, my broad advice would be for countries to um, try as much as possible to set the terms of their relationship with China as early as possible. Now, on the economic coercion point of what the United States can do, the United States can't solve every problem, but the United States does have a unique convening um, capability um, or, organize that, or organizing capability. So the United States could, for example, um, take the lead in coming up with a common definition of economic coercion, uh, a definition which would have a uh, legal effect when it comes to World Trade Organization and other multilateral treaty um, um, regimes. Um, then the United States could also look at coordinating some kind of organized um, pushback against China. So for example, if China commits what is formally identified as an instance of economic coercion, uh, which by definition is illegitimate, um, then there should there could be a coordinated series of small levies um, imposed on Chinese products. Now I know that seems extreme given the sort of um, open trading free market world that we've come from uh, until quite recently. 
But if you look at the sorts of things that have been occurring, not just against Australia, but in the world economic system in the last couple of years, uh, I, I don't think it's an anything goes laissez faire system anymore. So I think there needs to be that level of coordination. And, and you know, finally, just remember that Beijing has two objectives in coercing Australia economically. One is to try to force Australia to change its policies, which is failing. But the other objective, which is just as important, is to warn off other countries from even contemplating what Australia is doing. So the more coordination we have there, actually the less incentive Beijing has to use economic coercion against, or particularly American allies and partners. So we've talked about the China threat, so to speak, but let's talk about some of China's vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Um, I think you've argued that China aims to perpetuate its preferred magical narratives to conceal its weaknesses and vulnerabilities. I wonder if you can spell that out a little bit for me. What are some of the key vulnerabilities of China and the Beijing leadership, as you can see? Well, China tells the world, particularly under Xi Jinping, this narrative has been apparent. China tells the world that it has permanent objectives and, and that it will pay any price to achieve these objectives. Um, it, it, the Chinese Communist Party is undeterrable. Now, no regime is undeterrable. Um, every regime and every country has what you might call prohibitive costs. So, for example, it's clear to me that Xi Jinping, uh, given the way he's positioned himself, he cannot afford to oversee a foreign policy disaster. Um, so, so we do need to be able to raise the risk and the cost of any Chinese, particularly military adventurism, uh, to force Xi Jinping to recalculate. This could be with respect to Taiwan, which is the most serious flashpoint at the moment, but also the South China Sea and other maritime areas in particular. But even on the economic front, um, I think we have to look at the facts and get past this idea that China holds all the aces because it doesn't. Uh, China is still a net importer of innovation and technology. Uh, even if you look at the Made in China 2025 um, blueprint, uh, Beijing's blueprint there has been produced precisely because it feels vulnerable uh, in terms of its over-reliance on external technology, particularly from the United States and Europe. Um, it requires external finance, um, particularly access to American dollar finance. It requires the know-how from advanced economies. And finally, it, it requires the access to the domestic consumption markets of advanced economies. Uh, if you look at uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, for example, the whole thing doesn't really work if they can't substantially access the um, domestic consumption markets of Western Europe. You know, it's, it's, it, 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 the, the, the figures and the planning doesn't really work if China can't do that. Um, finally, we know that China um, overspends on its military and its national security and it underspends on social and public goods. Uh, that will work against China in the long term. And in, in that sense, we need to ensure that China um, has few incentives in the shorter term to take um, uh, military action, particularly in Taiwan Straits. Um, it, it, even, you know, I spoke earlier about the um, ability to ensure that it's a foreign policy disaster for China if they do attempt any kind of military adventurism. We also have to remember that China is a net importer of food and energy. So we need to understand the massive disruptions to China if they were to engage in that. Uh, but of course, China has to be deterred in believing that we would impose those sorts of disruptions if they were to take certain actions. I see, I see. Finally, a question about the United States. Uh, for, those of, for those of us who live in the United States, it seems like China is all over the news these days. In fact, President Biden has described China as our most serious competitor, not just for the United States, but he also characterized the fight between the United States and China as a battle between democracies and autocracies in, in the 21st century. So I wonder, given the backdrop of US-China competition, where does Australia see itself? And how does Australia sort of factor into this uh, bigger picture of US-China competition? Even though Australia is very reluctant to officially, um, um, officially declare that we, we are in a strategic competition with China, 
uh, in many respects we are. Uh, we have a fundamental stake on how the US-China competition plays out. Uh, there is the realisation that without the support of allies, such as Australia, um, we serve the role as enablers and force multipliers for the United States in the region, not just militarily, but economically and diplomatically as well. And we also realise that the United States cannot actually maintain its presence and influence in a region without the help of allies. So we, we believe that um, Australia needs to play that allied supporting role and we believe that it's, our, it's in our national interest to do so because if you do the maths, there is no viable balance and check against China without a fully engaged and present United States uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, beyond the US-China angle, uh, I mentioned that Australia is trying to renegoti renegotiate the terms of our relationship. You might even say we're trying to renegotiate the terms of our sovereignty and relationship with China. Uh, and our alliance with the United States gives us actually more leverage in renegotiating a more favourable relationship with China than we otherwise would have. So uh, in Australia, often debates about whether the alliance is a form of entrapment or whether it's something uh, worthwhile um, persevering with, but also deepening. I'm certainly of the latter category because that, that uh, gives us far more standing and relevance than we otherwise would have. I see, I see. Thank you for all the insights. It's been super helpful. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee, for this very insightful conversation. I look forward to talking with you more in the future. But thank you for your time and have a good rest of the day. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.